morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in in the interest of time, I'm just going to, uh, you know, not re really elaborate on some of the aspects that have been really covered in the presentation so far. Uh, so starting, you know, I, you know, Mr. Peters really talked about uh, the view an organization can take towards IP, and uh, you know how to really going about unlocking the value out of it. Uh, so I'm just going to share a different perspective, which is what is really happening in the market, uh, how the market has been evolving, and you know how certain corporations are reacting to it, and what is that really can be done about it. So if we start from basics, you know what is a business tool? That's something you know that provides a competitive advantage that contributes to the growth of a company by increasing its revenue or, you know, uh, helping managing the cost. Uh, if we look at IP traditionally, uh, it was always being seen as a, uh, something that gives you a competitive uh, advantage in the marketplace. You know, go back 10, 20, 30 years, people would file for patents or seek trademarks because they wanted to block their competitors uh, from using that intellectual property. But that view has been changing. There has been a paradigm shift, uh, especially over the last about 10 years, where IP is extensively being used as a revenue lever and a cost lever. And let's, you know, take a few examples to demonstrate that. Uh, you know, look at some of the companies, uh, you know, Qualcomm, IBM, uh, Texas Instruments, you know, they're making billions out of, you know, licensing and royalties uh, in the year 2012, with Qualcomm making roughly about $4 billion uh, in 2012. Uh, and then there is an extremely different set of companies, uh, Intellectual Ventures, Interdigital, Acacia, Rambus, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail, what role they play in the market space. Uh, but, you know, that's, that really, you know, shows how uh, IP is increasingly being used as a revenue lever. And not just as a revenue lever, but as a profit lever, too. Uh, if you go down a little bit deeper into Qualcomm, uh, you know, the numbers that show up on the slide, this basically, the first chart shows up uh, the quarterly uh, licensing revenue uh, that Qualcomm has generated from licensing royalties. And if you deduct the cost, uh, which is the R&D expenses, the money that was used to uh, generate that sales, you would see that of roughly about a billion dollars in you know, licensing revenue, uh, the profit was roughly in excess of $500 million, uh, which is obviously... Uh, not a small amount of number. And I'm just going to, I think, you know, dig a little deeper uh, into Qualcomm here using one of the questions that, you know, someone had asked here about the, the valuation of patents, right? So uh, I, I think, you know, it's, it's obviously a very uh, complicated or a complex stuff that how do you really value a patent, right? By definition, patent is unique, and therefore using historical data to assign a value, uh, you know, may or may not make sense in certain contexts. Uh, but one thing which has been changing is that how do you really estimate the value of a portfolio, right? So it's, it's very hard to value a patent. And Mr. Peters, as he put it, uh, the, the beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. So, but what certain organizations are doing is that using the historical numbers for patent royalty, royalties, they are coming up with the, you know, the value of the portfolio or the value that it contributes towards the enterprise value. So, you know, when I was reading this report, it basically said that, you know, when you look at Qualcomm's licensing revenue uh, and use uh, discounted cash flows method uh, using this run rate uh, and come up with a net present value, which comes to be roughly about $12 billion uh, in total. Uh, and Qualcomm has roughly about 10,000 patents in their portfolio for that size, uh, which is basically... Uh, the value of each patent is roughly about $1.3 billion, right? So it's, you know, it's, I'm not suggesting that uh, it's, it's, you know, that puzzle has been solved, but the point that I really want to make is that using the, you know, these stats, you know, which is uh, licensing and royalty revenues, it is relatively easier to come up with the value of a portfolio. And if you compare that number with, uh, you know, uh, Google's acquisition of Motorola Mobility, uh, each patent there was valued at roughly about $750,000, right? So Qualcomm's per patent value is roughly double of that, uh, if we just look at the numbers. IP is also being increasingly used as a cost management lever. And let's look at, you know, uh, RPX. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure pretty much everybody is familiar with RPX, but at the, at the core of it, the model of RPX is that it's a, you know, in layman terms, it's an insurance company. Uh, you know, you go buy a subscription, pay a certain amount of fee based on 
you know, your size and, you know, the portfolio and everything. And what they do is that they use a crowdsourcing model uh, to actually use that money to buy patents under litigation. So what they're really doing is mitigating threat for you, right? So companies like IBM, Google, Cisco, all these guys have invested. They're alliance members of RPX because they just want to counter that threat, uh, you know, from the marketplace. And similarly, intellectual ventures, you know, it's a patent aggregator. And same, similarly, you know, there are companies who have invested in them too. And, you know, sometimes, it, you know, you wonder that, you know, why, uh, you know, companies like Microsoft or Google would invest in both of them because the strategies are completely opposite to each other. So, but we can always keep wondering that. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, what has really happened is that alongside uh, there has been a corresponding evolution of the IP ecosystem. So traditional competitive advantage scenario, uh, you just have, you know, individual inventors, corporations, and specialized service providers like law firms, patent analytics providers, searching firms, and so on. But, you know, over, over the last about 10 years, this is the evolved ecosystem. So in, in addition to these traditional entities, you have aggregators or investors, you have transaction intermediaries, you, excuse me, you have enforcers, and you have specialized IP development or licensing companies. Uh, and here are a few examples, uh, you know, licensing specialists. So there are corporate licensing spin-outs, you know, Philips IP and standards, it's only one of them uh, as a licensing spin-out. Then, then there are university tech transfer agents, there are independent licensing companies like General Patent. Uh, we have different types of entities as transaction intermediaries like brokers like Pluritas, IPIG. We have auction houses like Ocean Tomo, and then, you know, there are m advisors, uh, PCT Capital and Pluritas again. And then there's a completely different breed of, uh, you know, entities which are aggregators of funds, intellectual ventures, RPX we already talked about. Uh, there are purely financial investors in the space. There are some European patent funds. Uh, Credit Suisse is very active, Deutsche Bank, uh, Alpha patent funds. Uh, and if we just look at a few other examples of litigation financiers, uh, so there are single inventor version firms, NTP, very famous in the RIM litigation, uh, RKL, Lemson Foundation. Uh, <laughs> all right. And then finally, there is a, a breed of IP development and licensing companies. So, you know, these guys uh, also invest a lot of money in coming up with inventions. So ARM, Inter, Digital, Rambus, Tessera. Uh, now, I really want to take an example of this evolution of uh, ecosystem. You know, Mr. Uh, Lakshmi Kumaran talked about, you know, the ecosystem part. Uh, but some of the companies have really adapted well. Uh, and one of the examples that stands out is Microsoft. Uh, and the reason I say that is pre-2000, pre, uh, uh, if you look at the Microsoft's patent portfolio, there were just about eight patents they filed or got granted in the first 15 years of their inception and roughly about another 1475 patents. So net-net in the first 25 years of the business in which they created a lot of enterprise value, they just had about 1500 patents. Uh, but they were sued very frequently in the late 90s and they had a minimal arsenal to counter that. Uh, my, Microsoft had a belief that you know, they had a very unique business model and you know, they, they essentially did not uh, you know, pay too much attention to IP because that was the, the traditional view of IP. But then they reacted very aggressively and started, you know, first building a portfolio. So if you look at the numbers, in the next five years, they, fi they got about 8,000 patents. And then in the following five years, they have a acquired a portfolio of roughly about another 30,000 patents. And now you see them in one of the top five pilots list uh, all the time. Not just that, uh, they also valued licensing. So they executed about 1,100 IP licensing agreements since about 2002. Uh, they invested in intellectual ventures. Uh, they invested in RPX. Uh, they bought AOS port patent portfolio of about, you know, roughly a billion dollars. And then finally, they were also part of the Rockstar Consortium. So when Nautil's portfolio was bid, uh, Rockstar acquired it for roughly four and a half billion dollars. And Microsoft is just one part of that. And Rockstar is now has been tasked to actually commercialize or really monetize that portfolio, right? So what you really see happening is that Microsoft taking a very, uh, you know, passive position to becoming a very aggressive position, which is not just building a portfolio, but using other means to assume a larger role in the IP ecosystem and truly use IP as a business tool, uh, you know, which is why I thought that it's an example which is really worth mentioning here. Now, adapting to the shift is very important, uh, and I think there are two aspects to it. One is that, you know, realizing uh, that IP is 
uh, tangible and a liquid asset. So you have seen several examples. Uh, and then finally, you know, taking a holistic view towards IP, uh, you know. And, you know, this is not just about, you know, taking, a f you know, having a very, uh, you know, focused uh, IP strategy. It is about, you know, taking a holistic view. You can't say that I'm going to just have a purely licensing strategy around IP. Uh, you have to start from the basics and see that, you know, what happens really the life cycle. So starting with IP and R&D strategy, uh, you know, you really track, you know, what the competition is doing, uh, you know, where are the opportunities in the market space, how is the landscape fragmented, uh, who are the prolific inventors, who are the prolific uh, companies in that space. So I think that understanding really helps you uh, figure out, you know, what's going on in the market and also, uh, you know, where the opportunities are. And once you've done that, uh, you know, Mr. Peters again talked about, you know, uh, in-house development of assets and then, you know, scouting or acquisitions. So these are the two means that you really use to build a patent portfolio, uh, which then really goes into the patent portfolio management aspects, and that's where the value starts really. I mean, so far it has been just a cost center for a company, uh, but thereafter, you know, you talk about means of IP, IP enforcement, uh, doing infringement analysis, f figuring out who are the people uh, who are trust trespassing your intellectual property, looking at IP monetization tools, and if there's a need, uh, getting into IP litigation, IP litigation and various stages. And I think throughout everywhere, you've got to be very careful uh, about the fact that you're not stepping on someone's shoes, which is all about IP risk mitigation. Uh, I think the, there are two real, I just want to flag two important considerations here uh, that, you know, you know certainly uh, taking a holistic view of IP is important, but then there should be strong, you know, it, one of the important factors is the prior art or the invalidity of certain patents. So, you know, this goes back to the same point that how, how, how strong is your assessment while you are filing for patents. So that is very, very important. Uh, similarly, you know, there's another example of Dow uh, Chemicals and Cargill litigation where uh, Cargill had sued uh, Dow Chemicals and in, a, in a, a patent infringement suit and Dow Chemicals countersued them on another uh, patent and the result of that case was Cargill lost their ba patent battle because the best mode of the invention wasn't disclosed in it. It was a canola oil litigation. And uh, at the same time, they lost the litigation on which Dow Chemical had counter countersued them. So they, you know, one of the business units was really, literally wiped out uh, because of that. But this goes back to the, the same point that, you know, if proper assessment is done, if the patent was filed with the right strategy in disclosing the best mode, as well as the fact that proper validity searches could have been done before actually going to someone and suing them. Uh, so that strong assessment is very, very important. And finally, you know, cost-effective execution, uh, which is equally important to change. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Any questions to Mr. Bala? Thank you.